Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 541. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 8th of October, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clergy and laity alike, welcome to the program. Obviously, we want you to help get the word out, like the program, share the program, send it to your friends, but most of all, comment. The comments are alive. It seems that the program, the, the second I click upload, you guys are busy giving us your opinion, correcting us or we're wrong, and giving us ideas for further things to cover. So we really appreciate that. Um, life is in the comments apparently thank you for that uh, we got lots of news but we're kind of on a strict schedule I have to be out of here to go to the dentist to have a filling replaced oh boy in about an hour and a half so we're gonna uh, get this show started lots of news going on but before we get to that how are you guys doing Gavin how is England you're no longer in France Oh, England! England is 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 lovely. Politically, it's complete chaos. I I wondered if, for the sake of my soul, I really just not read any newspapers. Uh, I, I don't listen to television anyway. We don't have a television, uh, and I don't much. I just listen to one news program on the radio to catch up at the end of the day, uh, and I read the newspapers. And I thought, I think, for the sake of my health, I should stop reading the newspapers. Just wait until the end of the month, and and see what happens to Brexit and our. Let's see if we have a democracy left. Um, I think it's very bad for the soul and the psyche in one state of sanity. We live in a, this is a very nasty period of turbulence. So probably better to pray rather than to um, alarm oneself terribly as the, as the papers do every day. We were talking about this last week. I don't watch news anymore. Uh, I'll occasionally read some you know, foreign policy news and stuff like that, but uh, I don't go to Drudge. I don't watch Fox News. I don't watch MSNBC, CNN. I just, my blood pressure can't handle it. And it's just the, the prevalence of fake news and these created stories and headline stories. You know, there's no longer news. There's just headlines. Well, Everything the is anger, just, yeah. The, the anger and the mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's really at, at an extraordinary level. There is this, I mean, I think both Chesterton uh, and... Uh, one of the early church fathers talked about people going mad. It was Abba Anthony who did it. Uh, but 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 you know, one of the signs of, a, of 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 society falling into real decadence is people going mad, and it feels like there's an element of madness going on today. There's as much in America as in as in England. Well, if I may, a sign of the times. Uh, Susan and I had uh, a light lunch the other day at the uh, clubhouse, the golf course, uh, where near where we live and they have all these TVs where usually they have uh, the cable news shows running and I noticed that they were not playing the cable news show they were running a rerun of Matlock now maybe it's just because we're in Florida and old people <laughs> like to watch Matlock which is a which is a mild uh, detective show but you know the they're not even putting them on in public places anymore, the news. They're no. turning on reruns of old 70s and 80s TV shows. Uh, well, I mean, that's the, the new thing. I mean, every news show now has to have a health advisory because it's worse than, worse than smoking. It's it's a new type of cancer. It's it's sad to watch. Uh, and it, it hurts in the workplace. Most of my customers, you know, are companies of about 50, 60, some have 100 people in an office space. And I'm reading more and more that the politics is dividing the offices, that people mm -hmm. just, you know, they come to work and they argue about, you know, what Trump did or what Boris did or what, you know, uh, Merkel did last night and tweeted out. And there's just, they come to work angry now. Kevin, I can guarantee you that nobody in my office of eight people has ever <laughs> argued about what Ang Angela Merkel did last <laughs> night. I, I, maybe it's just because we're a poor rural people yeah. folk down in the swamps, but I, I German politics has not really seized the day here yet. We have an international audience, and I want to recognize them. Even the German Anglicans, I want you to, we're, we're here for you guys, okay? We're, we're here for you. Uh, we should move on to news, because we're just talking about silly things. Um, I've never been to well, the let me, let me tell you what our big news, Kevin, okay. you, you skipped me. 
We announced to the Paris, the senior warden and I, that George Carey has accepted our invitation to come to our 25th anniversary celebration next wow. spring. So that's we'll, the, uh, that's we'll a good welcome score. Lord and Lady Carey for uh, a week or so in Florida. I didn't think it was that hard to tempt a man and his wife in their 80s to come to Florida in March, but from England, <laughs> but perhaps the weather hasn't changed yet in London. Well, you're also the the on staff Anglican TV mechanic. How's that going? Oh, I, <laughs> I saw some it. scars on your hand. I <laughs> replaced a camshaft position sensor. Oh, it's this hand. And folks, it's between the firewall and it's in the back of the engine on this particular model car. And it's always a good idea to do it first thing in the morning rather than late in the afternoon, because then the engine is not superheated and you don't burn yourself. But it wouldn't be car repair without skin burns in the Conger household. It, you know, you got to rest your hand against the manifold or lean your elbow against the engine block as you're underneath and fishing around for the screwdriver you dropped. On to the news. When things are going bad, leadership wants to always bring people together. We're walking together. We're going to have Indaba. We, as a, a vast Anglican people or a vast Catholic people, we want to see things together, being together. And Pope Francis has always said the Synod to him is a time of walking together. And now we have the Amazon Synod, which if you're watching, just cursely, you know, what's that going on down there? You're seeing chaos. You're seeing things that are being introduced that for me as an Anglican are a bit uncomfortable because I've seen this and followed the Roman Catholic Church for years and I always thought there were good dogmas and theology they would never stray from. That's kind of changing in the Amazon. I thought we could talk a little bit. George, first tell us what is the Amazon Synod and Gavin and you can certainly uh, have at it. The opening session of the Amazon Synod was yesterday, Monday. Mm -hmm. and where a number of issues are being discussed on the synodical level uh, as pertains to the Catholic Church in Brazil and South America, but Catholic Church being universal church, what's decided in one area pretty much is decided everywhere. Uh, Cardinal, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It's spelled H-U-M-M-E-S. It's Portuguese. He's Brazilian. Mm -hmm. Humes, uh, I'll That's just close. say. Yeah. Uh, said that what's on the agenda and remember now folks I'm reading the English translation of his Portuguese speech so I may not have all the mm -hmm. intonations of what it means but the ministry of women and the married priests so what is being telegraphed uh, un open for debate and discussion are allowing uh, clergy to be in essence married with families and allowing the ordination of women to the diaconate or perhaps to the priesthood um, these are quite remarkable opening steps to make. Now, the the reason why the, uh, some of the things that, if you look at the pretty pictures, it looks just like uh, an Episcopal Church consecration, where uh, because they have all the Indians with their he feathered headdresses and the sh shaman burning sagebrush and smoke and all the sort of nods to the local uh, indigenous cultures which is pretty in a National Geographic way, but is also deeply, deeply demonic and satanic. But, uh, well, there I've offered an opinion, not a fact. <laughs> no, but, uh, well, well, I mean... But it's the, just, folks, I have to, I'm not, I have the highest and deepest respect for the Catholic Church. But folks, as an Episcopalian, been there, done that. Uh, you guys are just recycling the worst excesses of Anglicanism uh, but you're doing it in such a hurried clip, you're going to outpace us in four or five years if you continue on this trajectory. I've I'm been reading um, Tom Holland's book, Dominion, and um, uh, I, Tom took me out to dinner about two years ago when he was writing it, saying, uh, he said very sweetly, and please forgive the ego trip here, he said, I'm, I've been reading what you've been writing and you sound like one of the few people in the country who are describing Christianity as I'm learning about it for what it what it truly is and why why is that and so we we talked about um, about this and and so, so let me get to the Amazonian Cinebiasa circuitous route uh, there's a very interesting 
podcast with the Church Times where he talks to a journalist called Andrew Brown that you'll know very well, George. Uh, and Andrew Brown is, is, a, is a bit of a meany old athe atheist, parasitic upon Christianity and uh, profoundly cynical. And Tom Holland is not yet born again, but he's intellectually become Christian. And the reason this matters is they, they have a huge argument about the relationship between Christianity and pagan culture, which is how we're going to get back to the Amazon Synod. And one of the things that um, Tom Holland says is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not yet fully immersed uh, as, a, as, a, as a personal Christian, but if anybody asks me about how Christianity should reassert itself in this secular culture, it ought to be by concentrating on angels and demons. Uh, because he said, that's the one thing you have as Christians that the rest of the society knows nothing about and would would be would benefit from your understanding of and then he he's very good in the book about the relationship but what people like boniface do in the face of saxon gods and how boniface and martin confronted the demonic and dark forces of local indigenous religion in order to convert people and to show that christ was stronger now there, there have been moments when for example saint augustine in 597 came to England and he was, suge it was suggested by Pope Gregory that he baptize local culture into Christianity. And so here you have two, two models that require quite some element of discernment. There are, there's a time when you look at what you're dealing with and you say, actually, this is really quite dark and dangerous. This needs penitence, cleansing, exorcism and baptism. Uh, and the other times when you say, the God of the universe has been at work through the consciences of these people. Let us give it a, an extra focus in Christ so that we can take what was good and make it and make it better. You need not to muddle these two approaches. <laughs> and the problem with the Amazon Synod is it looks like they've got it the wrong way around. They are trying to baptize into the faith that which is dark and demonic and dangerous. George was talking about the way, for example, uh, some cultures uh, expose their children uh, uh, to, to death and there are other things that Tom Holland said that I'd love to get back to in the program if we can as, as a friendly critic but it does seem to me that what we're encountering here is is um, the light motif that I've been trying to suggest as a form of analysis for a while is that that we're not dealing with live issues that spring out of the enlightenment anymore we're, we're dealing with the the toxic attack of modernity and secularism and relativism on the Christian tradition as it bites amongst Anglicans on one side and, and Catholics on the other. It's the same struggle. And here it seems to me that the people who organized the Amazonian Synod have given way to this, this relativistic, syncretistic spirit that Anglicanism gave way to a long time ago, but with potentially devastating consequences. Well, George, if I don't I'm trying to recall, did not Pope Francis basically say, hey, we're kind of Anglicans already? Doesn't he have a, a jealousy built in of the Anglican Church, the Anglican Communion? Well, that's uh, a refrain we've been hearing more and more of, of that the uh, Anglican experiment uh, is sort of a test case for uh, some of the, for the progressive wing of Catholicism. Um, and in the in the Amazonian Synod, we're seeing that sort of Anglican ethos take center stage. Now, if you're a supporter or opponent of women priests, or um, and you hear that the Synod is going to begin discussing this, you may think, oh, isn't this wonderful? Well, from a Protestant perspective, no, it's not. Because they're not actually talking about, is it right and is it true? The approach being taken by the Synod Fathers in the Amazon is this, will this work? It's pragmatic. Should we have, the, the issue, should we have married priests? Not because we need to examine the relationship of marriage and the sacraments and the, and the ministry, none of that. None of that's under discussion, but rather we have so few priests. We have 12 priests for 100,000 people. We need more of them. We have uh, all these married men with families and children who'd be happy to help out on Sunday. Let's ordain them. George, that's, I like to. That, that's pr pragmatic, <clears throat> but it is not an examination of. Sh of in other words, it it's the Anglican way of let's f let's forge a muddled compromise to get through the day, and then figure out why we're doing it later. That's the Anglican way on every moral issue of the twentieth century. 
from yes, contraception yes. to homosexuality <laughs> to women priests. We'll do it and then figure out why. The yes, Catholic like is now doing that. I'd like to distinguish, I think, between doing the right thing for the wrong reason uh, and and uh, doing the right thing for the right reason. I think both within Catholicism, there is no there is no theological reason why you can't have ordained Catholic clergy because we have them in the ordinariat. It, it's already it's already been happening, um, and nor is there any reason why you shouldn't give much more attention to the ministry of women. The question is why are you doing it? And I think the fear for the Catholic Orthodox is that both these important questions are being approached from an entirely improper basis. They're not working through a theology of it. They're not even actually doing it just for pragmatic reasons. What they're doing is that they're, they're, they're ushering in to the Catholic tradition uh, the presuppositions of liberal secularism. It's not, it's not even just pragmatic, George. If, if it was, it, they'd come to it with a kind of clean pair of hands and it could then be given wider more sophisticated theological thought within the development of tradition which is perfectly acceptable it's the notion that actually these people are secularists and they're bringing secular standards to the catholic church and there are a great many catholics who are profoundly worried by what this represents as as, a, as an assault on the way things have been done there was an article there was an interview with an indian chief native american indian or what do you call a Native American Brazilian? Uh, Indian. Indigenous. You could just say indigenous, I suppose. I don't know. Indigenous tribal leader. <laughs> yes. Who had been Roman Catholic. He's now a Pentecostal Christian. And his criticism of the synod underway from his perspective is that he and his tribe had been Roman Catholics, been, been reached first by Catholic missionaries a generation ago. But the new and, but the new generation of missionaries, of church leaders, whatnot, is not really interested in evangelization. And when these Pentecostal missionaries started coming into their areas and doing real evangelism, real teaching, real preaching, real living out a Christian life, en masse, these people are moving from a nominal Catholicism to a fervent uh, Protestantism, in this particular case, Pentecostalism. And so the the argument that well if we only had more priests we'd turn around the ter terrible hemorrhaging of the church in brazil that's what this indian leader was saying is this, that's not true the problem is not numbers it's a failure of evangelization and a failure of nerve at the very top to teach the unchanging truths of the gospel and of the church and jesus christ nothing to do with you've got more bodies you can fill the gap i mean it's just a totally inappropriate worldview being applied to the problem that uh, you know that faith is like a is a, is like a machine that you can just squeeze more out of it if you put these little inputs into it. The action of the spirit is missing from the planning and the understanding of the synod in the Amazon. This man is saying, "Well, we have that teaching from Paul: become all things to all men." And I see what the church is trying to do here is make itself more popular in the context of the population, and they're doing it wrong. The ends do not justify the means uh, in any way, sh shape, or form when you have to change your well, what, dogma. Well, one of the things is that the Catholic Church, not universally, but I'm mm -hmm. saying the leadership, the chancelleries in this part of the world are really keen into what is called primitivism. Uh, raising up and giving great deal of homage and blessing to native cultures uh, such that they, as Gavin says, baptize aspects of the native cultures. As this Indian chief said, part of our native culture was cannibalism and exposing deformed infants at birth. Uh, we, with the, the, you know, we stop that and we don't do cannibalism anymore because the police get involved, but there's, but the the uh, nod to primitivism basically allows us to expose infants to do to you know have people have abortions because th we're p aspects of our cult of our native indigenous culture that are in conflict with Christianity, the Christian ethos and moral worldview are now being given priority over or over Chris over essential Christian truths. Now. This is not just true in the Amazonia, 
This is true in the United States. It's true in England. It's true in Europe. As Gavin comes back to with secularism capturing the soul of the institutional leadership. And interestingly enough, it's it's also uh, being expressed in the whole ecological movement. So leaving aside whether we have our science right in terms of global warming, global change, the whole uh, ecological movement uh, is rooted in and carrying the church along with it in a kind of sanctification of nature. Um, and and, and we're, we're, we're back to what we had in the Old Testament where there's a conflict between God the Father who comes in as creation and challenges the fertility religions that people are giving themselves to because for a whole series of reasons they, they, they hope that they'll find in that the blessing of the harvest or because they're more instinctively and intuitively drawn to Mother Earth. But again, the church has to make a decision about whether or not it goes with the authority and the integrity of revelation or whether it slips into the, the pragmatism and the instinctive spirituality of the world it's surrounded by. It, it, you know, as St. Paul said, it's back, it's flesh versus spirit. But we're finding this worked out uh, in a global conceptual framework, not, not just um, as a piece of personal piety. Well, you know, and it's like one of the major announcements coming out of the first day of the Synod is that the Catholic Church is planting 100 acres of trees to offset the carbon, uh, carbon what not used by flying people from around the world to Amazonia. And I'm thinking, you know, what does my eternal salvation have to do with planting a tree? I mean, I learned all about Woodsy Owl when I was in third and fourth grade and be nice and pick up your litter. I don't think my salvation and my relationship with Jesus Christ is affected by how many trees I plant or don't plant. Well, that's because they made God the earth. They're, 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 the modernist God is earth, nature, animals even. And you need to respect, honor, and pay homage to the earth. And you will do that by planting the trees when you fly your darn golf jet to the Amazon. Part of my objection, well, this is unfair and because there's no one to respond to this, but uh -oh. the, the Synod is worshiping not God the creator, but the divine feminine. Yeah. One of the symbols of this Synod is a is a uh, modernist statue of a pregnant woman and we're told right up it's not the Virgin Mary it's nothing to do with that it's just a symbol of birth and creation and life and fertility this this is a fertility goddess this is the this is what lies behind the whole 20th century occult movement the environment envir environmental movement this is paganism it's substituting the Trinity for uh, Earth, for for uh, goddess worship, well, it's and this is being done. And this is being done. I mean, we uh, this is, was done on the in the precincts of Rome before the start of the synod. And now it's being celebrated full throttle in the Amazon right now. Do you guys and here's think, the joke well, of it: is that the local Catholics in the Amazon? I'm not talking about the German missionary bishops and the German missionary clergy. The local Catholics are having nothing to do with it in the Amazon, and those with actually a degree of uh, theological and uh, spiritual integrity have been the ones fleeing the Catholic Church because this is what they get. They don't get Jesus Christ; they get Gaia. Do you guys think that Pope Francis would be upset if? There were married priests within a a, a new uh, theology where they allow for married priests, not just the Episcopal transfers. Uh, I don't think he would be upset by that. <laughs> I, I'm not going to speak for Pope Francis. <laughs> I, 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 Pope Francis is a very. I, I'm finding it very difficult to make up my mind a, a, about him. Um, Every so often, he says things that I think are profoundly helpful. I mean, he's really been quite good about warning people about the reality of Satan uh, and said some fairly powerful, pungent things that seem to me to be solid. Um, but but yet, the, this, this the, some, the something about him makes me feel profoundly uncomfortable. Uh, it, it's got, it's rooted in a, a Jesuitical um, capitulation by by secular culture, and um, I, as you know, I, I I think there's a great deal to be said for married priests 
as there was in early apostolic times and from time to time as the discipline of the church has allowed. My fear is that, that Francis may want it for the wrong reasons. And the, the reasons matter a great deal here because as George has said, what we're struggling with is the importation of Gaia and of, of the... Um, uh, of, of the imminence against transcendence, motherhood against fatherhood, creation instead of creator. And in all through scripture and tradition, you have what is seen as being a, a balance. If I can just go to one, one, one side from there, because it, it's a very worthwhile point of thought, I think. Holland, when he was arguing with uh, Andrew Brown, was saying, it's absolutely ridiculous that, that the contemporary thrust, secular thrust against Christianity is to call it patriarchal because he sees saying the, the Me Too movement is essentially a form of, of, of secular Christianity because it attempts to safeguard vulnerable women against the abuse of power by men. But he said the movement that's done that best is Christianity. Christianity has safeguarded women by treating all people as sacred and sacral and requiring men to protect rather than to abuse women. Uh, and so the secular society has turned everything on its head by mistaking Christianity being patriarchal, when actually it's been enormously redemptive. Um, and he suggests that uh, both feminism and the Me Too movement are essentially um, uh, what he calls Christian attempts to deal with the hegemony of power, but, but attributing power to Christianity. And so one of the things we, we need to do in this present debate is to... Um, it is to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God, to give to the gospel and to Jesus and, and what is redemptive and to, to distinguish from what is redemptive that which is abusive. And again, the problem here is that in the Amazonian Synod, the discernment seems all wrong. They're doing certain things either unthinkingly or pragmatically, but for the wrong reasons because they've been given over to the spirit of the age. One of the reasons why the ordinariate has not worked and I very much doubt that it will work. But we can look is uh, is our pragmatic reasons. Um, the f flow of uh, clergy is slowing down. They're starting to create their own clergy. They've not been successful in building. If you compare them, say, to the ACNA in its growth and whatnot, it's the ordinary. It's a non-starter. And in England, I think they have one of the highest ratio of clergy to. Uh, lay people, lay peoples within any group, it's just not working. Now, one of the re and why is it wa working? Well, in the United States, I can tell you with absolute certainty, the Catholic bishops can't stand the ordinary. They just don't give these people the time of day. If they've got them under their wings, they give them grief. And the other thing is that to set up an ordinary that works, you have to change the whole system of Catholicism. A Catholic priest in the United States, a diocesan priest, usually makes in the mid-20s. His house is provided for, he's cared for in his old age, and he's given a, a stipend to buy books and go to casinos on weekends. There's no cost of family, taking the kids to the movies, yes. I, ha I have a church of 225 people on a Sunday, but 225 to 250, and I'm paid according to scale. I make over $100,000 a year because I'm expected to take care of my family, take care of my children. I'm not paid a lot of money. That is the standard in the Diocese of Central Florida. Most clergy, depending on their size, make between eighty dollars and $125,000 in this part of the world. There is no way the Catholic Church can have married families, clergy with families who are able to be supported, unless the wife is going to work full time or they don't have children. In other words, it's possible, but they have to change the whole parochial system to allow people to have families. And George, it's just I, not working, and it cannot work unless they're willing to make these tremendous changes. George, you're, you're right in the sense that there's an old Irish joke that says, you know, how would I get to Dublin? If I were you, sir, I wouldn't start from here. You're, you're, you're quite right. Just to start from here to get somewhere, it would be it's impossible to start from here to get there. But I don't think that's... That's not what the ordinary act's about. What the ordinary act is doing is providing a safety blanket for sacramental uh, Christians who understand the virtues of tradition. See, see Gavin, they, I've oh. always, let, I'm going to interrupt you. I, I apologize because I, I need to say this up front. God That's Christ. a load of crap. If you truly believe in the truths of Catholicism, you don't need the ordinary. 
that I mean, if you truly, no, you don't become an, an a Roman Catholic because you're mad at the Anglican world. That's one of the worst reasons to do anything. If, you know, I'm going to marry this woman because my old my old girlfriend ditched me. I'm mad at the Episcopal world because they've screwed things up. I don't like the, my bishop. I don't like women priests. Therefore, I become a Catholic. All the stuff of Marianism and all the other crap. Okay, well, I'll buy that. See, if you don't believe in the truths of the, the truths that this is the right way to go, then you shouldn't do it. Why sure. do you need the ordinariate if if you're if if you're anything other than annoyed with where you are? To me, it's a fraud. It's an absolute fraud. You either be a Catholic or you're not. George, some of what you said is delightful and absolutely true, but you've mixed it in with a whole load of other stuff, and untangling it is 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 going to take a few moments. Um, of course you're right if you're going to but but life is not that life, life is not quite as black and white or as compartmental sometimes it is and sometimes it ought to be but actually there's still an element of process to it as well and of course no one should move from one denomination to another uh, unless they're entirely convinced of the integrity of the uh, of the place they're moving to but nonetheless Things move in flux and they move slowly, and you need occasionally to have a rope bridge across a chasm in case people fall into the chasm and lose their faith and cease to function. So there is a place for a rope bridge as a salvific uh, gesture to allow people to get from A to B. But it's not, you're quite right, it's not a, um, a, a basis on which you can say, this is the way it will always be done and should always be done in the future. Um, I dare say the ordinary it may not work for a while, but if it allows some people to move from a place where they could no longer exist sacramentally and faithfully to a place where they can exist, then it's an act of it's an act of grace and should be if, seen as such. I, I disagree with you. I really disagree with you because we're not, we're not. If you're talking about sacramentally, if you don't believe that the sacraments that you're doing are valid, you need to start over and basically go through the process that gives you that validity which you believe is essential to the salvation of those people whom you're called to minister to. But to try to say, I want to do it in this fashion, keep these little bits because I find them attractive aesthetically. Uh, therefore, I want an Anglican-like uh, ritual. No, no, I want to have well, it. I, I, no, I mean, Gavin, that's the reality. I, I mean, that's I think the what, ordinary. I think what you're yeah. arguing here is I, I can't be a tech priest or I can't be an Anglican communion priest. I'm going to be a Roman Catholic generic, a light, a, a diet Roman Catholic priest. And, you know, I think that is that is not acceptable. You need I to start over. I do believe, and George, so, so what you're saying is true. Both what you've, you've both told the truth, but I don't think you're describing reality um, to, to do it. Um, so, but it's not my. I'm not. It's not for me to argue with the ordinary. What I think. What I'm. Let's let's try and get a more a more um, global sense of what's going on. There is there is an attempt to reconf. Let us see the ordinary as part of the attempt to reconfigure the denominations in order to provide a greater degree of of Christianity that has integrity. Now, to get there, you may have to go through some convoluted things that do not seem particularly logical. Or, or, or helpful, but what what would the ultimate aim is a reconstituted Christianity that keeps both tradition and scripture, and then getting there is a bit messy. Um, now, I think in a sense the Amazonian synod ought to be trying to do that, but actually, it's n it it it's, uh, it's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons again. So, what we really should be asking is, uh, how does the church reform itself? Uh, and find a way to a deeper integrity in the complex and convoluted system we're in. And you're quite, quite right, George, that the Catholic Church couldn't start accepting wholesale uh, married clergy. It doesn't have the resources to do it. But the fact that you can't get there with with um, full clarity and full coherence shouldn't stop you trying to get there by some by another route if you can. But well, why should you change Catholicism to do that? Yeah. Well, because it, it was always because you always did have married clergy in the first place. The Orthodox have got married clergy. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not. But uh, Gavin, I think we're talking about two different things. Yeah, I'm not uh, talking uh, about married clergy. I'm talking about seeking to Anglicanize the Roman Catholic rite and the Roman Catholic ethos to accommodate my particular sensibilities, my I, the generic my. I agree completely. So what we have is something that looks like it's going to end up in the same place, but it's doing two different things for two different reasons. See, so there's no point at all in terms of trying to make the Catholic Church 
uh, um, to, to do a form of Episcopalianism, which is what we're suggesting Francis might be attracted to. But, but, but there is a great deal of point in trying to allow the Roman Catholic Church to develop in a way that is true to its roots and to what the Spirit is calling it to do. Okay, it's well, uh, no, but if I just make okay, make it make this is, quick because people are getting tired. You know, this is the this is it. the this is the if you will the genius or if you will the holiness of John Henry Newman. He didn't he 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 took he from an issue of personal conscience. He made a choice to uh, to give up that personal conscience, and when he entered the Catholic Church, and to allow his views to be subsumed into that of a church that he felt was grounded upon divine revelation. What we're seeing in those who seek to recreate Catholicism in their own image is not the Newman path of trying to find a safe harbor or trying to find a connection to a deeper, more apostolic worldview. What we're seeing now is a Catholicism that is that seeks to take not the best of Anglicanism, but the worst of Anglicanism, and accommodate it to the spirit of the age uh, without any sense that you, when you become a Roman Catholic, you are giving up everything else. George, I agree with you, but, but, but let me just say, your, 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 bright, your, your strokes are too broad. Uh, if you would only make your, 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 the, 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 the paintbrush that you're painting with a little narrower, it That's applies terrible. to certain people at certain points. At certain, what you said is absolutely right. Your mistake I think you're making is making your criticism global of either all Catholics or all Catholicism or all renewal. The points you've made are absolutely right, but I think they apply in a more restricted way than you're applying. Well, that's true, and but it's also the way this show works. We talk about how horrible the Episcopal Church is. I'm an Episcopal. Oh, <laughs> uh, in other words, we do paint with broad brushes. We do yeah. paint with hyperbole. We do paint with these massive statements that this group of clergy are dreadful, this group are wonderful. Uh, Gavin, you're absolutely right. So I think that's a fair criticism that I need to keep in mind when I speak. So. But that's what we. But isn't this what we do for each other? We we, we we take a position and then we try and refine it and bring some more focus to it. And um, I, that that's how it, as it should be. Well, that's what the genius of the program is. We can sit and talk for thirty-seven whole minutes, oh, and we, no, hold on. But we we don't end and as enemies. We may take two different positions, but we show this in a very Christian context. We leave this program as friends. We leave this program as brothers. We leave this program as people who have a future mission together to bring news to the church, to encourage the church, and to enlighten the church. And um, that's just how this mix works. And it, I really appreciate the fact that even though you guys disagree on certain uh, you know, principles within the Anglican ordinariate, which, whatever that is, uh, <laughs> you know, there's no Baptist ordinariate there's no methodist ordinariate they want a lutheran ordinariate but that is what it is um and i have a great appreciation because i get to sit here and listen to you guys knowing that at the end you guys are going to have a few great moments of well okay i agree yeah i agree i agree gavin agrees with george and george agrees with gavin and kevin's in the middle that's the way it works uh guys we've hit 40 minutes I know we have one more story. We'll move that on to Friday or next week's. Uh, Gavin, you're traveling Friday, so we can't record? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. We'll re uh, move on until next week. I may have an interview with somebody else I'll put up. Uh, I put up the videos from the Forward in Faith uh, event they had in August. I'm going to put up the videos from New Wineskins uh, later this week, so enjoy those. If you are subscribed to Anglican TV, which you should be by clicking that little red button. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and we may have managed to make the Amazonian Synod look quite civilized. By contrast, you've been listening to episode 541 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>